Thank you everybody for coming and uh, we all know that today we are passing through very uh, difficult times in the political history of our country and uh, <clears throat> this political crisis is in some ways, in many ways is unprecedented and uh, progressive liberals are facing difficult to uh, address this issue. We are trying in very ways but uh, still we know that we have a long way to go. So, sometimes you say that democracy is in danger uh, because of the semi-fascist or fascist regime that has come up. But the supporters of the regime say that, how do you say that it is a danger to democracy because, because we got elected democratically? Not once, twice. How do you say that we are not we are against democracy. So democracy itself has to be discussed. And there are, uh, what is the solution? And what is the nature of the crisis? And how left and liberals are responding? And uh, how to understand that response? So there are so many questions, uh, right from understanding the nature of the crisis, the root causes of the crisis, and what political options are there before the left and liberals. Um, so these are very, very important issues that we want to generate a discussion. Political action, of course, is necessary to tackle this problem, but uh, political action with sound political understanding of the situation. Without that, we know that political action cannot lead to successful uh, results. So it is an attempt to understand the problem and also to propose some tentative solutions to it. NSI is trying to generate this discussion across the country and through various forums, through online forums like democracy dialogues and other lectures, and also physical meetings like this. And uh, it's part of that series. The, today, to make the presentation, to initiate the discussion, we have among us Dr. Ravi Sinha, a political activist for so many decades, for the past 40 years he is engaged in left politics and also a theorist. So uh, he will make the presentation and then we will have a discussion. I hope everybody will participate in the discussion actively. So I request uh, Comrade Ravi Sinha to make his presentation. Thank you, Bhargava. And uh, thank you all uh, for coming. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I will be making some argument, you know, through basically in three parts. Uh, one, of course, as Bhargav said, we start with the political crisis itself that India is uh, is gripped under. You know. um, I will not spend much time about describing the crisis because you are as well aware as I am you know, about the crisis itself. But I will <coughs> dwell more on how this crisis has come about because it has long been in the making. And now that it is all over us, then everyone is talking about it. Not everyone, there are, there is the other side which thinks that India is doing great. And finally, after 800 or 1200 years, you know, Hindu rule, you know, uh, has been established. You know. So I'm not talking of them, that side. Uh, people who have some idea about what India is going through, um, they are well aware about <coughs> what the crisis, how the crisis is impacting India. But how it has come about, about that aspect, you know, all of us have our opinions. We are all uh, engaged with the society, engaged with politics. So we are all have our opinions. Uh, part of what I have to say, I think, you know, it will be uh, <coughs> much easily agreeable. But part of the argument might be where we need further discussions. So in the first part, I will talk about how and why this crisis has come about. In the second part, what India can do about it. 
and in the third part, you know, whatever idea we get about what India can do about it, what people can do about it, in that what we can, we who come from left, what kind of role we can play in that or what kind of role we should play in that. Of course, I am assuming that left can be described by one world that is left, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, that is hard to do. Left is very fragmented. Uh, left is, uh, has a lot of internal disagreements. But I am talking about, you can say, a broad left from one end of the spectrum to the other, you know, from CPI to radical left. Um, you can s just conceptually say left for that broad left, even though <laughs> different parts of that spectrum will not agree with each other or you can even at times say that we are talking about some imaginary left you know as if left if left were one if left were united if left had internal agreement about what to do about the current political situation then what it will do so um, <coughs> in that part today I will not um, dwell much upon the internal disagreements and fragmentation that is within left. You know. I will assume that left is one, left is united, and this is the task left has at hand. You know. And then further things can come in our discussion. So the first thing, um, before we get into how this crisis has come about, uh, in order to be brief about that, um, I will just narrow the definition of this crisis. And Bhargava already pointed out in that direction. The way I will conceptually describe the crisis is that democracy is threatened by democracy itself. The democratic process itself has taken India to this point in history. Now, I will hopefully explain, you know, I am not criticizing or denouncing democracy. I am not, I do not plan to throw the baby with the bathwater. You know. uh, but, you know, we have to grapple with this very difficult situation when the threat to democracy um, that India is facing has arrived through the democratic route, through the democratic uh, path. So that is the nature of uh, that is how um, I will try to understand uh, all that is happening. All that is happening has different aspects. You know, and as I said, you know, we will all agree on that. You know, there is very serious economic crisis. You know, uh, huge unemployment, huge poverty. You know, even the people who supposedly were not supposedly who were taken out. We go by government statistics. The 20 crore or more people who were taken out of the poverty, below poverty line, that, uh, above that line, have fallen back, you know, below that poverty line. Unemployment is unprecedented, even in a country like India, where unemployment has always been there, but never like this, you know, price rise, you know, and the whole country is being sold to few corporate houses. Not sold, being given handed out, you know, to the corporate houses. So we all know the material economic aspects of what this crisis is doing to our country and to our society. <clears throat> and then, of course, you know, there is this, um, this uh, great political game, malignant political game going on, in which people themselves would say that, you know, what are you talking about? Why are you worried about how poor I am or how starving I am? You know, now Hindu rule is there. You know, so you know one of the WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp, uh, those things that go around this RSS in this RSS circle. One of the things I saw recently, it said that, oh, if you voted, uh, <coughs> if you voted uh, Modi for petrol and gas, you know. Uh, and, 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 and food, you know, forget about it, don't vote for him, you know, I mean, we did not vote, we should realize that we did not vote him for these things. 
and whatever we voted him for, that he is doing. You know, that namely that Hindu rule after, you know, 1200 years of so-called gulami, you know, uh, Hindu rule is there. So that thing, this thing is already, um, it has always been in their strategy, but now that the elections are approaching, already you can see the inkling of how they will, what will be played out. I mean, the mandir is more or less built. It will be inaugurated in January uh, 2024. You know, other issues will be raised along that line. Uh, so all that we know. This is so. This is the social, civilizational, cultural part. So there is economic crisis. There is the social, cultural, civilizational crisis that the entire country is is is, is going through. And then you have this huge corporate support. You know. I don't know whether whole corporate, all corporate houses are supporting Modi or not, but he doesn't probably need, you know, all support either because few of them who are in league with him and who have benefited, you know, greatly, you know, they have amassed enough wealth, you know, to give enough money to the Sangh Parivar and to BJP, you know, so that money becomes a big factor. So you have a uh, unlimited money. You have, quote unquote, as they say, largest political party in the world. You have huge army, you know, of activists, you know, which really, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, that word should not be used. Activists, you know, goons, basically, you know. How are you? <laughs> uh, I, he, I come from UP, you know, and UP we know from our experience, we know that uh, there are you know, in Lucknow, for example, the neighborhoods have hoodlums, you know, and the recent practice of the last several years has been that they almost get a stipend, a salary, you know, 2,000, you know, depending on who is who, um, 5,000 to 15,000 rupees comes to them automatically, and they don't have to do anything. They just have to appear at required time, some, in some, in some demonstration in some lynching, in some, you know, violence, you know, that is, you know, organized occasionally, you know, they have to appear there. So they have that kind of money. All district headquarters of BJP are like corporate, you know, uh, you know, corporate buildings, you know, and so on. So the money power and the manpower, I think, you know, man, it is, you know, we can be Appropriate, appropriately gendered, if we call it manpower, largely, you know, in, when we are talking about the, those goons, even though woman power is not behind in supporting Hindutva. That also, that, that also is equally true. So this uh, money power, uh, personnel, the goon power, all that thing is there, and nobody knows how to deal with them. You know. I mean, more or less. I think there are good developments too. I will come to that, you know. But, and good developments that should have come from us, it hasn't come from us. It, it hasn't come from left. It has come from sections of the liberal, you know, uh, parties and liberal force, forces. So that is more or less the nature of the crisis. But I think we should try to understand, you know, this, instead of being descriptive about it, let us try to analyze it, you know, how do we come to grip with why this is happening. And for that it is essential to see it as a, uh, uh, as democracy itself undoing democracy or damaging democracy. A small clarification in between, in fact we are all, we, I assume that more or less we come from various sections of left, you know. So probably some explanation is in order that why am I worried about democracy? Did we not say that democ is this democracy is class rule? This democracy is dictatorship of the bourgeoisie? Did we not criticize this democracy to be a farce or to be a method to fool people into accepting the hegemony of the capitalist rule? We said all that. I am not uh, backing off. In some way, I will say that you know that is a correct description. But that is a correct description at a very different level. Now that this crisis has arrived, 
we have to answer to ourselves that what do we mean, why, why are we getting worried about democracy? Wasn't democracy always flawed? And to, that is the point I will like to argue, that we are rightly worried about democracy. That democracy, we don't have a uh, better um, uh, alternative to democracy as a whole. We can improve democracy. We can improve democracy in a very fundamental way, namely, you know, capitalist democracy can be replaced by socialist democracy. You know, it must be replaced by socialist democracy. But we are not running away from the concept of democracy. We are not, you know, I mean, those accusations that are hurled at us that, oh, these people, they themselves say that it is, it will be dictatorship of the proletariat. Those terms we get caught into. And dictatorship is pro of proletariat is a technical term coined in a def definite historical phase at the beginning of, you know, Marxist, you know, political science, so to speak. And those who care to understand what was being said would recognize that dictatorship of proletariat, the way it was coined and the way it was used was not against democracy. In fact, it was a larger form of democracy, a deeper form of democracy, a more real form of democracy. So all that we are not getting into today. All I want to um, uh, underline today is that the reason we are worried about threat to democracy is that the way this threat has arrived, we are, you know, India is knocking at the doors of fascism of some kind, if it, is, it has not already entered that door, if, in, you know, already uh, fascism is in power. Some kind of, you know, we will not haggle about technical definitions of when it is fascism and when it is less than fascism. You know, I mean, that broadly that danger is very much there. Not danger, that reality is very much there. All that is happening around you, you can see. Now, if we are critical of bourgeois democracy, and if we leftists, you know, have spent all our political life criticizing bourgeois democracy and criticizing, you know, likes of Nehru and so on, now we are being forced to look back at that criticism. Said, is, is it, can we say, that it doesn't make a difference, you know, if, if in history of, um, recent history of India has gone through a path in which it just so happens that we started with Nehru and now we landed up with Modi, but that doesn't surprise us. Those people who say that it is natural that, you know, we started with Nehru and ended up, Modi, there is no surprise and there is no shock and there is no uh, worry in there, I would say that then we don't understand politics. It should be a shock. It should be a wonder. It should be, we should try to understand how come India started with someone like Nehru and ended up with some like, someone like Modi. It makes a big difference and that difference should worry us. It makes a big difference no matter what our ideology is, what our definition of bourgeois democracy is. This is a huge difference and we should be, we have very, very um, internal reasons to get worried. That when fascism comes about, of course it arises on the basis of making some community, some identity as the target, as the enemy, as it happened in case of Hitler's Germany, Jews were the target. But you know, even, I mean, Jews suffered. You know, that's one of the most tragic incidents of human history. And yet, um, more than them, left suffered, left was decimated, left was physically eliminated. So along with all the, you know, what are called gypsies and, you know, other um, marginal, you know, communities, they were all eliminated, left was largely eliminated. Of course, Jews, he tried to eliminate Jews too. You know. So left, better worry about it. But I am right now not arguing that because left will be threatened, or left is threatened, you know, by a fascist regime, by Hindutva, I am not asking you to get worried just on that basis. The threat is much larger. The entire India, you know, as uh, the kind of India 
we all wanted in different ways after we got rid of colonialism. That whole project is under, un, uh, 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 under threat. The whole national project is under threat and whole modern project, modern means modern republic, you know, equal citizenship, you know, um, uh, a political structure, a modern po political structure arising in a very pre-modern kind of society, you know, in a, in a society that has many social, cultural, civilizational fault lines. The fault lines can be on account of religions, religious fault lines. The most famous fault lines, of course, in, you know, in, on the subcontinent is caste fault line. There are these caste divisions, you know. Of course, like everywhere else, but in our peculiar way, some, in some ways, more intense ways, we have the gender fault line, you know. So all those social, civilizational, cultural, subterranean fault lines are there. In such a society, for a modern republic to arise, that was almost a miracle. We did not appreciate it. We did not appreciate it. You know, we were always critical and, you know, in many ways rightly so, I mean. So, the way, um, oh, let me mention it right now, you know, I mean, I don't have to go that segmented because, because you know, I mean, left, uh, what could you expect left to do? Left was the principal opposition after 1952 first election in the first parliament. So Congress was uh, the hegemonic force. Congress has led the national movement. Congress, Congress has led the anti-colonial movement. That was the task of the time. That was the principal task. Left thought that it should lead. Left could have led. If left had led, maybe revolution would have happened. Maybe India would be in a far better situation. For various historical reasons, that did not happen. Congress led the anti-colonial movement. Congress got the political hegemony. Congress was known as the party of the likes of Gandhi and Nehru. It was naturally accepted by people in the sense that any party, to whatever extent it was accepted by people, Congress had the largest acceptance. So Congress naturally, when the modern republic came, when constitution came, you know, Congress naturally became the natural ruling party and left became the opposition because only other political force which was critical of Congress and yet which was very active politically and which has large, large enough political base because of its very hard struggle, you know, it had created all the trade unions, it had created Kisan Sabhaj, it had, you know, I mean, Again, as I was saying yesterday in a similar meeting, you know, we are sitting in Telangana. Telangana movement was there. All these glorious struggles, which is, you know, which is, you know, which is our heritage, you know. We, we, we are, we inherit, you know, all the, uh, those glorious struggles and past of those glor glorious struggles. All that had gained the left a strong foothold in a society which was not that ready, at least culturally, civilizationally, not that ready for any modern political outfit. So Congress went through long struggle and because it led the anti-colonial movement, which was the task of the time, Congress naturally emerged at the top. Left had a much more difficult time, but yes, we right now, given our situation, we can appreciate that we were in a much better situation. And we came in the first elections as the principal opposition. So our criticism of Congress is understandable. And yet we have to look at um, the uh, uh, underline this fact. If we have to now say that, oh, it is a disaster that a country that has started with Nehru, Nehru landed up with Modi, then we have to analyze how did it happen. What aspects of the entire problem we did not understand well. That we have to understand. And that is the part I will say in that very briefly how this, um, this, this, uh, this crisis, the democratic threat to democracy, how, how this crisis has arisen. So the story starts from there. You know, I will not go in the past that you know, the seeds of the republic were sown in, in the anti-colonial movement. 
And if the seeds of the modern republic were sown in the anti-colonial movement, in the national movement, in a way, seeds of the republic were also sown by colonialism. Because, you know, we should not you know, forget that when colonialism came, it came to loot and plunder and rule over us and oppress us. But at the same time, whatever twists and turns of history, it uh, brought on the table the question of limited self-rule. It brought on the question of, you know, modern political institutions. At least, you know, if in 1909, the minority, uh, what is that, uh, communal award. The communal award, if it was given, why, you know, why there was talk about, you know, Muslims electing Muslims, their own representatives, you know, the communal award, you know. Because there was some talk of elections, some limited elections. There was some talk of, you know, representative forms of democracy. And this was in turn of the century itself, you know, it was not clear how long they were taking it for granted, the British, that we will rule forever. They were at the peak of their power, First World War and Second World War and all the things that led to British decline, you know, um, were far in future yet. So they were at the peak of their power and yet they were giving some limited uh, democracy and how in the, this democracy will be, um, will, you know, what shape it will take that was already under this discussion. All the political questions that arose led to, for example, 1928 uh, Nehru Committee report, you know, uh, Mutilal, headed by Motilal Nehru, you know, which contains salient features of what later came as Constitution of India. So it was a long debate, you know, political debate that was taking place along with the struggles on the ground that was happening, you know, against the British. Now, so it's a, again, through that complex struggle, these miraculous things appeared, that society had many very old civilizational cultural fault lines that could result in political quakes at times. And yet somehow this modern republic arose. Of course, we know the pain that we went through. We went through the pain of partition. And the political fault lines, not political fault lines, social, cultural fault lines were at work in the partition too. That is one of the most violent events of history. From one to two million people, somewhere in between one and two million people were killed in, in partition. Our situation is so bad that we haven't even counted. We haven't counted our dead you know, properly. And not only we haven't counted our dead properly, we haven't come to grips with the fact, very uncomfortable fact, that people killed people. You know, there is, you know, it's, it's very common for us progressive forces as well as many others, many kinds of forces to blame the British for many things they should be blamed. But to blame the British to escape our own problems, that escapism we should not you know, entertain in ourselves. Yes. Yeah, those, again, that, I mean, you are right. Many partition led to, partition resulted from many complex interplay. And that is a very interesting history. It just so happens that inside NSI for last several months, you know, six months, we are dwelling on that, trying to understand that. So what you are saying, what you are saying, I will agree with that. But that was not the only thing. It was not that just that British divide and rule alone resulted in partition, that will be too simplistic. There were some divisions in our society. There were some problems in our society and people who were ruling over us, you know, and who were playing all kinds of political tactics and games, you know, in order to maintain their colonial rule, they of course took advantage of that. So they did um, uh, divide and rule. But did they create the, all the divisions? Or in some forms, divisions were already there. They just took advantage of that. We have to take both the sides. So 
all I am saying, even though that is not today's topic, all I am saying is that let us not have a simplistic answer to why partition happened. Even if they, suppose, let me put it this way, even if I accept the thesis that partition happened only because of the British, only because of their manipulation and their design, then why did the riots happen on that scale? Did they organize it, the riots? They did not organize the riots. They tried, in fact, to control it. And all three large forces who were responsible together for partition, or who are held responsible for partition, namely the British Congress and Muslim League, all these three large political formations, when riots erupted, the leaders of all three sections, the colonial rulers, Congress rulers, and even Jinnah, they were all shouting from the rooftop, telling the colonial masters to control it. Some one of the books that we now are study circle, we read, you know, and Jinnah was quoted as saying, calling Punjab governor and saying that, shoot, shoot the Muslims too if you know, I don't care, but to stop the riots. He was talking of Punjab when the riots had erupted in Punjab. So he was saying that. So he should be blamed for direct action, whatever, 16th of August, 1946 uh, or 47, Bengal part, you know, that triggered the riots. Even there, Muslims killed Hindus, but then Hindus killed Muslims in larger numbers. And when it came to Punjab, you know, most fears, most gruesome violence happened in Punjab, you know. We can go into the detail of who triggered it, but by triggering something, if it happens at a large scale, just triggering cannot be blamed. You know, everywhere you can't trigger that kind of violence. In some societies, you can trigger that kind of violence. And what we are pointing out, that don't take the blame away from anybody. If the political forces were responsible for those developments, those very disturbing developments, then for sure assess them, evaluate them, take a position on them. But that this kind of colossal violence and this kind of colossal historical event cannot just be explained by you know, only the role of political forces. There was something must be in the society for that kind of large-scale violence to erupt. Otherwise, trains could have passed, you know, trains from this side to that side, and trains from that side to this side on parallel tracks. Why should the trains stop and one people from one train should kill, try to kill the people from the other train? You know, I am just, you know, figuratively saying, but it is not figurative, more something like this did happen you know, at least in Punjab part of partition. So, and if, if I, I can dwell a little bit on that point, that if you look at the world even today, where are the, the this kind of people-to-people -people violence is more likely? I am not talking of a state killing people. The state kills people everywhere. You know. The state has the monopoly of violence. So it does that. But along with state violence, which is the largest form of violence that humanity faces, you know, along with that there is this large scale violence where people kill people. And that kind of violence where it is more likely? It is more likely not in the West which is which has been very violent society and West imperial imperialist imperialist West which has done violence to all over the world. And yet in those societies people to people violence is practically absent. But, but in our place, in our kind of society, that violence can happen. In Rwanda, that violent violence can happen. In Eastern Europe earlier, that kind of violence could happen. You know, 150 years ago or 100 years ago, even in Germany, that kind of violence could happen. You know, when Jews were targeted. So we have to keep that in mind that we should not have a a a, a few line simple explanation of such large complex phenomena because by blaming the political forces like the colonials or like Jinnah communal forces or like you know bourgeois forces like Congress you know the whole phenomenon does not get explained so that is the main point coming back to what we were saying that this this emergence you know for us the wonder is good wonder is good miracle is 
that this kind of modern republic arose in a society like ours, which has these kind of fault lines. That's, that's a good thing, that it happened. Then, if I go back to uh, the, my position of my political childhood, by political childhood I mean when I was getting trained as a left activist, you know, I was told that there is nothing good about this bourgeois democracy, this is classroom. So how do I explain to myself the change of my position, change of my understanding, which is not a personal change, that which I am arguing that entire left should go through this process and should answer these questions. Namely, if this constitution was only a, a, an instrument of class rule and this constitution is being threatened by the Hindutva fascist forces, do I say that I don't take a side, it doesn't matter to me? Or if I say that no, this constitution must be defended because it will be a bad thing if their kind of constitution, whatever they have in mind, Manusmriti or whatever, you know, if that comes, it will be a disaster and it will be a disaster compared to this constitution that we have. I believe in this position. Then I have to explain to myself that how and why do I say this now to myself? Why and how did I change my position? And that brings me to understand the democratic polity of our country in two parts. One part is class rule, which is always true. And I stand by my old position, the position that I was, I was educated about and trained in in my younger days, that this is the class rule. There is no doubt about it. But that does not exhaust it. Politics, when it takes roots in a social soil, you know, class is an important component of that politics, but that does not exhaust it. You know. The other part I will call is the, in one word, and I will explain that, because that word is very controversial, I will call it modernity. And I separate modernity from capitalism. Capitalism is class system, you know, is, 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 is a class structure. Modernity often is confused with capitalism. People say that modernity is a handmaiden of capitalism, you know, that it was born at the same time, capitalism used it, propagated it. It is a political instrument in the hands of, of capitalism and imperialism in order to establish their own class rule in their society and in order to inflict imperialist rule on the rest of the world. You know, that, I think, is a totally mistaken idea. If we go into the detail of history, and if by modernity I mean just two things, the idea of freedom, idea of sovereignty of every individual, and freedom for every individual, that concept, plus the related concept of reason, rationality, that er arose from religious debates, you know, in Europe, you know, philosophical, religious debate turned into philosophical debates, you know, and philosophical debates, you know, pre prepared the intellectual atmosphere for modern science to emerge, modern reason to emerge. All that was happening together, and it is an accident of history that that was happening in, in one single part of the world, namely Western Europe. And that was not the most developed part of the world. We were the more developed part till, till, till 17th, 18th century. We were the more developed part than Europe. China was the more developed part than Europe. So I will not go into that detail for whatever accidentally or for other deeper reasons. For some reason, it just so happened that modernity arose there. Just because it arose there, we should not call it capitalist modernity. If you, know, you, if you look at the detailed history, modernity arises, you know, all these debates that I'm clubbing as modernity, starting from debates inside Christianity, the split of Christianity between Catholics and Protestants and all those things, and go through modern science, modern philosophy. You know, gradually the religious philosophy turns into modern philosophy and people like, you know, Descartes and Lebanese and Locke and, and all these people emerge. Suddenly, you know, the philosophy becomes secularized. You know. 
before that philosophy was all religious and in that atmosphere then you know Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton all that story you know all those people arise so science arises when does capitalism becomes a powerful system that can make modernity its servant that happens much later that happens in 18th century Britain that happens in you know 19th century uh, France and Germany you know capitalism comes to that kind of power so that its ideological hegemony becomes complete over the society so that then it can shape modernity in a way so that it is only that shape is encouraged which is beneficial to capitalism you know, that did happen you know. that happens much later once capitalism gains that kind of political and social power but modernity bo was born 300 years earlier at least the process began 300 years earlier see, uh, 100 years earlier so what I am making is even though it's a theoretical point I will soon come back to our political task that we are discussing but it, all this thing is in, uh, important because lot of things sit in our the way we were trained lot of ideas sit in our head and we say that oh look somebody can talk you know some there is something good about modernity isn't modernity an imperialist project you know so how can we talk about you know all the crimes of modernity all the nuclear bombs all Hiroshima and Nagasaki you know people reduce science to that you know people reduce science to nuclear bombs people reduce science to pesticides people reduce science to you know the soil being poisoned and the water being poisoned you know all that also has happened but to blame science for that? Can laws of nature be blamed for that? No. Uh, nuclear bomb? So the reason I am saying this is that this clouds our political vision even about today. So we must separate these two things, modernity and capitalism. We must separate system from rest of society. We must separate you know, the social, cultural, layers of society, those layers that deposit, that get deposited over thousands of years. No. Religion, when was it born? Is it an instrument of class rule? But, you know, I mean, many different class, class, you know, systems came and went and religion has been around. Caste system, for which we are known all over the world, we have the sole royalty over this, you know, yeah, grand system. No. This caste system was it product of a class rule, you know, and this kind of explanation that oh whichever new class rule comes co-opts these old systems into it, you know, that is too simplistic an explanation. Why does caste survives? Does caste survive only because a state and capitalism has adopted it? But if a, a state and capitalism, if the system did not adopt caste, you know, for its own purposes will caste go away? Can you have this kind of simplistic view that caste and patriarchy and such deep uh, social layers survive only because a class rule has adopted it? That is too simplistic an explanation. Those divisions exist in us and those us as a society, us as a civilization, us as a culture. And if those divisions exist inside us, you know, they can only be aggravated, protected and so on by the class rule. They cannot be created, you know, and they cannot be, their life cannot be made eternal just by the class rule. So this division must be made. That class rule is there, you know, capitalism is there, but modernity is there too. And one is acceptable, the other is not. Capitalism is not acceptable. Capitalism is, you know, that all the crimes must be brought to the doors of capitalism, whether wars, whether imperialism, and so on. But don't bring all those crimes to the door of modernity, because modernity is a positive force. Modernity is the force that for the first time brought modern science into existence. Fundamental equality of human beings into existence. Modernity has not been realized anywhere in the world even there where it was born, it is not fully realized. So it has not established full equality of humans 
irrespective of their identities. You know, it has not been um, established fully anywhere in the world, and yet you cannot say that different societies have not made different levels of progress on that uh, axis. So all the societies that I count, where large-scale communal violence or sectarian violence, people killing people, is less likely to happen. Which are those societies? Those societies are more modern societies than the others. The societies which are less modern societies, that is where Rwanda happens, that is where Indian partition happens, that is where Gujarat happens. It, that doesn't happen in those societies. So we do not dare to say this because it appears as if we are praising imperialism because those are, you know, the countries, you know, which have exercised imperialism in colonial times and if, even now in some different forms, they are exercising. But we must be careful not to, as I said, not to throw the baby with bathwater. So modernity must be separated from capital. Coming back to where we were in our argument, in the Constitution, I uphold the Constitution to the extent that if this is being threatened and if there is threat of this being thrown out or this being replaced by some other more regressive version of Constitution, then I defend it because I see both these things enshrined in Constitution. The capitalist class rule is enshrined in the Constitution and modern, modern values are also enshrined in the Constitution. For example, the constitution, at least in principle, which these people are now threatening to undo, gives equal citizenship, you know, without any consideration for religion, caste or gender. Equal citizenship. You know, it, in fact, it was miraculous, you know. I mean, when universal suffrage came to India, when this constitution was, um, was implemented, many of those developed Western societies did not have universal suffrage. In as developed a society as, uh, I think, Switzerland, you know, uh, the universal suffrage came as late as 1972 or 1973. So we were, in many ways, given our social civilizational condition, we made very strong progress along certain lines. That part of constitution which gives equal citizenship, that part of constitution which makes every individual equal before law, that part of constitution which not only does this give this equality but even in some forms gives affirmative action. Any modern enlightened constitution should not only give equality, should also have some mechanism to help those who cannot, um, who cannot gain that equality. Okay? So some affirmative action has to be there so that people could be helped to become equal, okay? Even that is there in the constitution. So this, these modern parts of equal citizenship, including those who need help, you know, constitution and the state providing that help, all that part is there. Do you think that when we have, we have socialist constitution, then this modern com component will not be there in our constitution? Socialist elements, very mild in the sense that if you call some version of welfare state as socialist, you know, if it depends on, on how I visualize socialism. If I visualize socialism as a complete break, there is nothing good along the class line in this constitution, you know, then I will say that the class part will have to be completely overthrown. But you are making a very good point and you are pointing towards a, an important aspect that even in the classroom, because of the world history, because of democratic values and so on, there are these welfare state kind of concept is also there. Okay? So for example, public sector was there. And those things also are being undone. So a, a, a country that had a modern republic that had mixed economy, that was known as Nehruvian socialism, and we ridiculed it, we criticized it. If now that is being destroyed, and some people will point out that, oh, BJP is not destroying it, Congress itself destroyed it. True. You know, Congress opened the door, you know, in 80s, you know, post-emergency regimes, they became more and more economically regressive. 
all regimes became economically regressive. Can we, so, can we, can we say the general dividend in academia which divides the entire APS piece as the social schools, the Guardian schools, the development schools, that uh, is the general academic division which we are on. Yeah. Can we, can we go with it? Can you repeat that? I didn't hear the terms. DPS. What? The socialist principles. Huh, socialist. Then, then the Gandhian principles. Uh -huh. Then the liberal principles. Liberal principles. This, this is a broad academic division of DPS. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those, I do not know. I do not know how to identify specifically Gandhian principle in the constitution. But I am no expert on constitution and no expert on Gandhian principle. If that could be identified, I would include that. But I can understand why people say that there are some socialist principle also can be seen in the constitution. And of course, liberal principles are there. Liberal principles are more, more explicit, you know. So liberal principles are there. But that is what, you know, while if academia says that, I will agree with that, with the qualification that don't be in a hurry to fix the nature of a constitution lock, stock and barrel. All these conflicting features are there in the constitution. So the liberal principles are there, but then the class principle, private ownership principle, you know, all those things are there too. Class issues are there too. Individual is there, that individual should be equal. But rightly, as well as wrongly, there are places where it is rightly gives right to communities collective rights it gives. And then we also have to think about certain collective rights that supersede, you know, individual rights. There, we will have to think about that, you know, those are debatable points whether uniform civil code should be there or not. Now, we have opposed uniform civil code because that was used as a danda in the hands of Sangh Parivar, you know, because Congress was accused of appeasement and universal civil code became almost a slogan to oppose Congress and to oppose, you know, minority rights, you know. So we on left often went against BJP and other slogans of uniform civil code, but not uniformly. Many movements, you know, I mean, even in progressive or left kind of feminist movement, they came to the understanding that uniform civil code is desirable not for the reasons that these people are saying, no. not for the reasons of, you know, um, uh, uh, criticizing Congress or taking away the minority rights. So I will say that constitution is a complex object. It has agreeable as well as disagreeable features. Right now when it is under threat and I feel like, you know, I am being part partly threatened, or citizenship is being partly threatened, modernity is being partly threatened. I am saying this because modernity for me is desirable. Individual rights are desirable. Human rights are desirable. They are not bourgeois deceptions. They are real things and they must be there even in our socialist constitution. Hopefully socialism will arrive in better conditions in future than it arrived in 20th century. 20th century socialism was very troubled socialism. It arrived only in very backward and undemocratic societies, you know, in, in feudal system societies and monarchical systems, military dictatorship and all that, you know. We have never made a revolution ever again directly against capitalism under a bourgeois democratic system. So that's a completely new thing. And so we don't know how that socialism will arrive. That is for left to discuss and ponder over. But whenever we find that path to that future socialism, that future socialism will not violate the democratic principles and the human rights and individual liberty and rigorous uh, acceptance of objectivity of science. You know, no. not, will not be forced to prematurely say that even science is class science no. and it will not give rise to disasters like Lysenko, those of you who know, you know, Lysenko affair in Soviet Union, no. where science was ideologized, made into an ideology and so on. So we will do better when it comes, we will be more democratic, more scientific, more objective and will pay better respect to individual freedom 
and individual human rights. Okay? The elements of these are there in this bourgeois constitution itself. So that is the, see, you know my point of departure, that I divide entire society abstractly. I distill the system part separate, that is capitalism, socialism, feudalism and all that. That is a state, you know, that is class rule and so on. But when I take that away from the society, society does not become vacuum. Not everything in society is a direct, instantaneous product of the class rule that is operating. Religion is not created by capitalism. Both capitalism and religion are large realities of our societies. And we say that capitalism is the foundation, religion is the superstructure. That is nonsense. That doesn't explain. So both of them have existed long. We should not mechanically interpret this base superstructure kind of model to reduce all material social structures to being mere products of class relations. So caste is not uh, just class, uh, is, is class relation. Class, caste is material in itself. We leftists and we Marxists should not exert too hard to prove that in India caste is class and class is caste. That doesn't help. It goes in the wrong direction. As if we will accept the caste reality only if somebody shows to us that it is nothing but class reality. What kind of, in Hindi we will call, what kind of jid is that? You know, you know, we shouldn't have that jid, you know. Caste is a reality in itself. Religion is a reality in itself. It has existed for thousands of years, under which, as I said, many, many different class rules have come and gone. So if, and if modernity is a slogan against caste system, if modernity is a slogan against communities running roughshod over the rights of individuals, rights of a Dalit individual or rights of a woman individual, you know, if communities do that, then modernity comes on the side of the oppressed communities because the fundamental principle of modernity is equality of all individuals. You know. So can you derive ethics completely from um, other larger economic and social realities? I do not have an answer to that. Probably yes, probably not. So maybe in a practical way, we will derive as much as we can derive. But whatever is not derived, we will accept that as a good practice, as a philosophical position. So if I cannot derive honesty from socialism, I am just taking a hypothetical example, that socialism is our system. And somehow, our um, theory of socialism, you know, which is class um, uh, structure of the society, can I derive that I should be honest, this ethical value, you know, from the theory of socialism, I am not sure. I am not sure. But better, large part of ethics, larger part of ethics can be derived from socialism as compared to capitalism. And I am happy about that. Capitalism will treat, will, if you derive anything, it is easier to derive selfishness from capitalism than, um, what is the reverse of uh, uh, selfishness, uh, altruism, than deriving altruism from capitalist logic. But in socialism, I can derive altruism from the socialist goal. So for me, that is better. If I can do better in the ethical realm compared to capitalism, that is all I can hope for. But I'm not sure whether I can derive all ethics, all values from the system or not. Of course, it's a direct Right, so there is, a, there, is a, there is a problem with that system, that in order, that is the, our critique of capitalism. We say that in order for capitalism to survive as a system, they have to teach them, every individual, to become a smart in a selfish way and take care of himself or herself and always maximize the gains. 
So people, and then there is no end to it. People go into all kinds of complex mathematical economic uh, products, you know, in order to maximize their gains, and then the housing collapse happens, and the whole world economy collapses. You know? So you are absolutely right, you know, that is the nature of that system. Yeah. So coming back to what we were saying, I was just, I went into these things just in order to explain, because this is a kind of progressive leftist circle, that why we should defend the constitution. This constitution that we are opposed to also. You know, why we should defend this constitution, we should def the deeper reason for defending it is modernity. And by modernity, I don't mean, you know, modernity is not a, an ajar, an instrument of capitalism. Modernity is an independent, you know, gain, achievement of humanity. No, independent of other aspects, you know. and that's what you know. You were saying very well, you know, very well put. You know, so this uh, this modernity part is the reason why I would say that I have no qualms about defending the constitution, and I will also say that elements of this constitution will further improve, will further go into the socialist period. That is the period that will have the continuity. The discontinuity part is the system part the class rule part, that class rule will be interrupted and capitalism will hopefully be replaced by socialism. So that is the my theoretical reason. Now coming back to the concrete practical today's politics we are talking about, how did this kind of constitution come about? We often complain, I remember, I complained that, you know, to myself and I was taught to complain about this fact that constituent assembly was not based on full universal suffering, that only 13% or so of electorate, you know, property people, educated people, and so on, were allowed to, to, to um, uh, vote, you know, constitute the constituent assembly. Now, I don't know anymore how much, how big a point I would want to make about universal suffrage. Because universal suffrage, often in our leftist kind of understanding is taken as a final answer to all problems, is a panacea to all solutions. Oh, you don't go to people, ask people. That is a standard sentence for us. But there is a deep problem hidden there too. Constitution did not come about because people voted for it. Constitution came about, even the good part of constitution, the modernity part of constitution came about because of historical reasons. The whole humanity in different parts of the world through three or five hundred years had a struggle to come up with the goodness of those, those values. What in one word let me call it democratic values. So democratic values as good value had emerged through a struggle of three or five hundred years, you know, and those values were enshrined in the constitution. So when we talk of democracy, then we have to separate between two things. As in society, we are separating between class part and the rest of society part, the modernity part. Same way in democracy, we also have to see the two different faces of the same democracy coin. One part I will call is the institutional framework, which in some ways, fully or partly or in a complicated way, you know, it enshrines those democratic values. So the institutional framework is constitution I was talking about. That is part of the institutional framework of democracy. You cannot practice democracy without some institutional framework. You cannot always go to people and ask that, you know, should I do this or should I do that? You know, any government cannot do that. It is practically not feasible. And it is not even desirable because it is not true that all the good values are imbibed by any p people at a given time. So if you want to have a referendum today, you know, whether caste system should be abolished or not, no, no, or religion should play a role in politics or not, if you frame this question and go to people for referendum, do you think a desirable outcome will come? I doubt it. I doubt it. So when the society was practicing sati pratha, you know, could you go to society, you know, you know Sati Pratha, no? uh, could you go to, could Raja Ram Mohan Rai or the British or whoever, could go to the society and ask the society that whether Sati Pratha should be abolished or not? 
people in minority can imbibe better values and when a struggle starts it always starts with a minority good struggles always are started by a minority of people so you have to understand that if you subject if you put under um, referendum kind of democracy all questions then it is not guaranteed that always good results will come out many a times very bad results will come out so what happens if you say an ideal situation ideal situation never happens but more or less institutional framework contains the democratic values and what is the other side I am talking about is the popular processes of democracy like elections like referenda and so on so if the popular process of democracy is the other side of the coin you know, which one should be weighted more the answer is it depends on the historical moment it depends on the society we in our populism have said that oh always go to people because instrumental uh, uh, institutional framework is framework of class rule why do you trust that so go to people and believe what people say but we never realize that people can say much worse things people can come to much worse conclusions so whatever we gain it is like you know it is like you are climbing some tough climb of history and wherever you reach then you make some plane there so that you don't fall below that so democracy or institutional framework of, of democracy is like that in a very hard climb we have come to some point we should not fall below that we should ensure that and this institutional framework of democracy is that kind of guarantee so this is very counterintuitive for a leftist very strange for a leftist to say that there are times and there are societies when I will believe the institutional framework more than the popular framework of democracy okay the danger let me come back to that the danger to democracy that I started with and you know, my argument the danger of democracy has come in the form of the institutional form of democracy is being threatened by popular processes of democracy by and large that is happening in India because we cannot explain the support to Hindutva by a significant proportion of the society based on oh they have been fooled oh EVMs oh money power oh goons oh the booze being distributed you know, on the you know pre-election night you know all these things may play a role but you are underestimating the real support that Hindutva and fascism has among large sections of the people that support is real and if we don't accept that that support is real you know we are fooling ourselves and we cannot start even the fight so that support is real where does that support come from that support comes from simple things that there are very deep fault lines in our society those deep fault lines if it says if Hindu Muslim divide is there and if some political force comes and makes the argument that everybody got their Rashtra their state or their nation state why shouldn't Hindus get a nation state too so Hindu Rashtra argument will carry genuine traction with lot of people they will not be willing to listen any further argument that oh Jews should have Israel you know, and Muslims should have Pakistan and many other countries you know and Christians of course have you know, all the Christian countries and only Hindus should be deprived of a you know, state if Hindus will not have a Hindu Rashtra in India where will they have Hindu Rashtra in India you know that in the world that 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 kind of argument has lot of traction that kind of argument has a lot of traction because Hindu identity is a real identity you cannot wish that away and any this kind of identity always gets strengthened if political forces allies, uh, arise to to carve out a minority identity all the blames can be put on on them so I am saying simple things everybody knows it but in the political analysis we don't factor it in we explain away all people voting their own interest you know in UP in COVID times people dying in lakhs and dead bodies floating in Ganga oxygen and hospitals not being anywhere there and soon after elections happen and the same government which is responsible for that human tragedy and disaster and the same gets you know, government gets elected to power 
UP is the land where Modi comes and openly, you know, you can see the video says that, you know, आप लोगों ने हमारा नमक खाया है, you know, ये लोग क्या जानते हैं कि हम आप हमी को वोट देंगे, आपने हमारा नमक खाया है, you know that phrase ना, saying that, you know, you have, I don't know how to translate that in English. Can you say it in Urdu? Yeah. हाँ. Then you are obliged, you know. So as if Modi is, you know, the the whole the whole country's resources are Modi's. You know, and if he is throwing five kilo grains to uh, people, you know, he, you know, people are eating his salt and they will vote for it and people do vote for it. People do vote for it. Many people, many educated people. I am coming from Bangalore and very mm, learned scientist, you know, one very bright scientist was arguing that maybe we middle class, we don't understand that he is doing something that really works, you know, that, you know, uh, that, that um, uh, gas. Uh, uh, is, 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 is the uh, connection is there, maybe 5 kilo is reaching there, maybe you know the toilets are there you know and so on. Even if it is there, even if it is not working, we know that it is not working, but even if it was working, you know, is this not depoliticization of the masses people and can you have democracy by depoliticizing the voters? This is all depoliticization of people that hamara namak khaya hai isli hamko vote so this, this, why is this possible? Why? Because those social divisions and that kind of consciousness sits there in the social mind. And we have to work against that. If we don't realize the task, and if we realize, you know, if we don't realize that the political playing field itself is tilted against us, by us I mean not only the leftists, but also, you know, relatively better liberals relatively progressive liberals, you know, rev relatively enlightened liberals, it is tilted against them too. So if the playing field itself is tilted, you cannot just blame the players. Ah, the, that guy was playing with a, you know, better equipment, you know, better boots, you know. So that, how long can we complain about that? We have to realize that the playing field is tilted and we have to do something about it. So let me quickly, I have taken more the time than I plan to, I always do that, you know, and I always say this, and yet again I go on to take more time. So forgive me for that. But quickly let me come to what should India do, in given this tough problem, that this is the reason why democracy is threatening democracy. Democratic process itself is threatening democratic values and institutional framework of democracy. What should India do? I think on a large scale we can have all our revolutionary theories and practices. But we leftists are not going to be able to defeat this monster. That's not possible. Left is fragmented, too weak, doesn't have wide mass support. To whatever extent it survives, it has mass support. We, we salute ourselves for that. No, there is no doubt. But you know, the task is too large for left. Left is shrinking. Whichever way you define left, from CPI, CPM and so on, you know, left has been shrinking and internally quarrels. Left cannot do it. And yet left has to play a role. I will come in a minute to that, the last point. What should India do? Having said that, having painted this picture, I also should not forget that same India has the miracle of this constitution. Same India had this modern institutions. Same India has, the, the modernity has taken some roots in there. It, it is not impossible to argue in the same India where the argument that Hindus should have their own Rashtra, you know, that argument has a lot of traction. The same India also ha should have a lot of traction that, okay, leave this, you know, po politics is something else, a state is something else, you know, econom economy is something else, let us not do Hindu-Muslim there, you know, all Indians who live here are Indians and they are Indian citizens, you know, so there should be a republic, you know, whose citizens are equal based on this all, all the other argument you know that someone like Rahul Gandhi is making you know surprisingly effectively now with you know everybody laughed at him you know he was the papu you know, but he made that argument very well you know for that he had to walk 4000 kilometers you know that's a separate matter but in order to make that argument you know he succeeded in making that argument those arguments are valid don't reject those arguments just because Congress or somebody in Congress is making it. And you know, somebody who has been ridiculed as Papu is making it. Those arguments are valid. And those arguments have attraction. 
people listen to those arguments because in the same society where Hindutva argument has traction, modernity has attraction too. And if these people take the country to disaster, which they are, and right now the country is not paying attention, they are taking to disaster. Then one day will come when people in large numbers will quickly change their sides and will come to the modernity argument that yeah, yeah, this is a disaster, you know, because this all people's resources are throwing away to handful of um, corporates economy you will see you know I mean economy will keep on growing Indian kind of economy even if you don't do anything at all still it will grow at four five percent so the question is whether it will grow at five percent or it will grow at eight no. percent on a consistent basis and can you imagine the kind of lie that we can take and digest this fellow in the parliament in answer to the president um, you know uh, whatever debate he said that 2004 to 2014 was a lost decade. Can you believe that? You know, 2004 to 2014, by all bourgeois standards or whatever standards, were the best decades. When the fastest growth India has seen on a relatively long period of time happened between those two UPA regimes. Okay, half of UPA two was it, you know, uh, the decline, a disaster. But on the average, you know. It was never like that. So earlier they used to say that all 70 years are, you know, were a disaster. Now they have found out some way to say only those 10 years are disaster. 10 best years for Indian economy are being projected as disaster years. You know. And this is somebody is saying who is taking the economy to, to, to a disaster precipice. You know. even, for, even foreign policy, something very sinister is happening in the foreign policy. That, you know, we leftists have always accused the Indian rulers to sit in the lap of American imperialism. And we have had at times good reasons for that, we have had at times bad reasons for that. We are also responsible for bringing Modi to power and for this disaster. Because of our, you know, dogmatic understanding of imperialism, you know, left front walked out of UPA in 2000 eight or nine on that nuclear deal and that started the process of decline of UPA no. and a political decline then the economic decline came but it just so happened that that was also the time when global economy has collapsed you know and uh, that impact was being felt anyway so this 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 kind of understanding you know that uh, Indian rulers are naturally subservient to Western imperialism this is also too, too simplistic. They are at times subservient. But look now what is happening. China is up appearing as the pole, other pole. If there will be bipolar world now, it will be between the Western bloc and China. You know. China is doing miracles in terms of rapid development, no matter what you think about China ideologically. You know. But it's a, that's a, one of the supremely rising capitalist country now. And these people, because of their internal political reasons, because this has to be, this is a combination of Hindutva plus nationalism. You know. So this is 56 in chest, you know, that kind of thing. One thing that can immediately collapse the 56 in chest is that if China walks over some territory of India, China can very well do that. It is wise enough not to do that. You know, what will it gain? It will be, you know, it will give ammunition to the Western adversary, you know, and they will shout, you know, that look, you know, China is invading India. Why would China do that? If, but if it wanted to do that, you know, it could easily do that. And you know how the dictators collapse. The dictators who become dictators on the basis of nationalist slogans, being nationalists, they collapse because they can't keep that supreme superhero nationalism going on. So one thing is certain that if China, it is proven that China has taken territory from India, that 56 inch will, will, will shrink. And that is why they are quiet about it. No, it's, you know, I'm not saying that China has invaded India or taken very large chunks of land, but it has taken some chunks of land. And that they are quiet about. Just as they are quiet about Adani, they are quiet about uh, Rafale, they are uh, all the corrupt deal, same way they are quiet about what is happening on the Chinese frontier. And now what he is doing, he is going and sitting with Putin. 
Putin who has invaded Ukraine, Putin who is a mafia gang leader. No. It's a tragedy that where we had our first revolution, that land is being ruled by a mafia dictator. No. He is sitting with that and he is taking oil. They are imposing sanctions on Russia. India is taking crude oil from Russia, refining it and selling it to Europe. Europe which is imposing sanctions. So you see the farce that is going on. And in that India is making money. And in that, you know, this fellow is, is, is gaining the cloud with sitting with these pro very, very, very troubling regimes. China, no matter what miracle is doing, for me it's a very troubling regime. No. I don't uh, appreciate the regime. I appreciate the fact that somehow forcefully they are taking the Chinese society at a very rapid rate, taking it out of poverty and making it a power. So they are doing good for themselves. But I don't like that because I don't agree with that kind of regime and that kind of a state. Putin, of course, less said is, you know, and then he has Erdogan and, you know, the, as you were saying the other day, you know, the, our Subhash was saying, somebody, one of our colleagues was saying that we did not connect this dot that suddenly India is helping Turkey in this um, earthquake, you know, I mean, this, all these, these similar kind of leaders, he had his buddy Trump ruling America. So America was good when Trump was ruling. Now for him it is no longer good because it can raise some human rights and press freedom questions. So now it is no good. You know? But Bolsonaro was good, Trump was good, Erdogan is good, Putin is good, look who is good for him. And this thing is being done in a con by an Indian state which has, despite change of regimes, has been consistently quote-unquote non-aligned. Has not completely sat in any... So he is taking the country to disaster in many ways. And people can be woken up, you know. People will listen to us better when the disaster happens. Fascism is always defeated not so much by struggles as by disasters. Hitler was defeated not because German people turned against him, you know. Hitler was, you know, he just, you know, inflicted a disaster on Germany, Second World War, and that is why it happened. Hopefully that will not happen to India. Hopefully, you know, there will be an electoral way, peaceful way that will be found to get rid of this regime which is taking India uh, to disaster, which should not be acceptable to us even though we want to take India to revolution, you know. But, you know, we should not put all the basket in that egg that because we work for revolution, nothing else matters. How does it matter if India goes to disaster? Maybe the objective conditions for revolution will be riper if India goes to disaster. That is a sick logic. We shouldn't make people suffer because we want to make revolution and we want to promise a better future to them. So we should be more realistic. So this is one part. If India has to dwell on, so my solution is what can India do? Very simple, very long argument, long wided argument, but the conclusion is very simple. India should depend on modernity to confront Hindutva. There is no other way to do that. Think, come up with a slogan. No. Come up with a slogan of that is one pure class slogan. You know, that, you know, rich poor gap should be eliminated. Um, unemployment should be, all those are good slow slogans, but, but by itself it will not carry traction. No. Economic argument have not carried traction in the electoral arena, even among a starving people. And I am giving you this, this, this example that people died because of Yogi's government and they voted Yogi government back to power. So economic argument are material argument, important argument, must be made all the time, but by itself will not suffice. That is what these people have, our adversaries have learned well. They don't make only economic argument, but they don't leave economic ar argument either. They talk of development. So, but the foundation is Hindutva. Foundation is identity. Foundation is communalism. That has to be confronted. Communalism and Hindutva cannot be confronted pure on economic slogans. Economic slogans will be in the supportive role. Main slogan will be the modernist slogans. And you have to devise strategies for that. That one crude slogan that it translates into defend the constitution. Because to the extent that, so 
institutional framework of democracy must be defended. Even institutional framework of democracy must be defended even if people, the popular form of democracy, is trying to undo the institutional framework of democracy. Our leftist common sense will say that go to people. But these are difficult times, these are unusual times. The leftist common sense should be that defend the institutional framework of democracy. This is very counterintuitive, but this I firmly believe that India has no option but to go for that. If you go only with populism, they have a better chance to win. Populism will, so you have to do value-based politics, and that value-based politics has to be founded on modernity, values of modernity. Let me quickly conclude by saying then what should left do? Well, left has to take care of itself first. So how can I even talk about left when left is from CPI to you know, 36 ML groups, you know, all these things. You know. We don't know how to stand up you know, because we, are, we have flowed everybody down you know, among ourselves. You know. You know, if, you know, we have hit everybody so hard among ourselves you know, that how do we you know, stand up? So, so I am not talking of that part this evening. All I am saying is that I am imagining that while we keep on fighting among ourselves, which should be while we keep on arguing among ourselves and find what is the path of evolution, while we do that, at the same time we should have, we should be sensible enough to realize two things. That left cannot defeat fascism, number one, the current Hindutva fascism. So somebody else has to do. And who has to do? The liberal bourgeois has to do. And liberal bourgeois itself is divided, you know, regional parties plus Congress. Congress itself is divided. The moment you utter the word Congress, people say, oh, what Congress you are talking about? The same people who are corrupt, the same people who brought new economic policy, the same people who are ruled by a dynasty, all things come up. These are all foolish things to say. No, political arena is never going to be a pure arena. You have to know what you want, and you want to defeat Hindutva fascism. So don't rake up, you know, that whether you know six were massacred in 84 or not. Of course, six, six were massacred in 84, but can you uh, uh, play this game that 2002 Gujarat should be counterposed with 1984 Delhi or something like that? Don't break those things up. See, you cannot defeat them. Congress on its own cannot defeat them. Congress left to the way Congress has been cannot defeat them. That is the realization that has come to, you know, apparently, I don't know him, but you know, whatever I see on television or whoever, that is the realization that has come to Rahul Gandhi that Congress itself is a problem. So Congress for the first time, he is attempting to turn it into a ideological party. I, Congress has never been a party. Congress has been an umbrella that had all kinds of forces. Half of them, uh, them can easily walk over to BJP without batting an eyelid. So he is trying to be very blunt about it. He is taking the name of RSS, name of Hindutva, name of Adani and Ambani, name of you know, Hamdo Hamare Do, all those things. Who is speaking? Not the left, not anybody, any of the regional parties. He is just saying all the right things. Maybe he is sticking his neck out and saying it in a loud enough way so that people wake up to what he is seeing is, is true. So we know all the limitations of Congress, you know, and yet left must find a way to um, find a role in this coalition, future coalition, that can be put together to defeat, uh, defeat Hindutva fascism. And there also, having said, you know, let, let the, uh, many leftists will agree to that. And suddenly they will jump to, let us not make Congress hegemony. You know, those are corrupt and dynast and so on. Let us, you know, strengthen the hands of Mamta or TRS or, um, uh, not TRS or TRS, what is the name of KCR. KCR, sorry. Uh, K KCR or uh, Arvind Kejriwal or whoever. No. If we jump from one mistake, we jump on another mistake. Tal se gira khajur pe atka. We should clearly realize that that coalition is not possible without B. Rahul's kind of ideological bourgeois force being in the center. And we know it is bourgeois. We know tomorrow we have to fight the same force. You know. But recognize the challenge that is today, you know, without being that kind of ideological part of Congress being strong, 
no federal india will be possible you know i say in one simple word that diversity of all kind whether cultural or social or political diversity of all kind survives under modernity only modern systems and modern states and modern ideologies have presented better examples of accommodating diversity otherwise diversity is mutually destructive all identities whom we want to protect you know in our you know in this post modern era you know all identities that we want to save left to themselves they will kill each other they will fight against each other it is only under a, under a modern system only under under a modern state and only under a, under a modern ideological formation that with great difficulty modernity has learned to respect diversity that is the gain of later half of 20th century post second world war 20th century with all the immigration happening where i am in the same the people who sit and i know personally many many indians you know very rich indian they sit in us you know and they are democrats there they fight for my uh, rights of immigrants and indian minority and other minorities there and he, here they feed hindutva they send lot of money and lot of resources to hindutva so for here you know modi is great and for there you no know, trump is threatening so they feel and trump see the triangle and modi likes trump you know they don't like trump but they like modi that is the kind of you know political ideology that is we are get stuck with what i am saying is that modernity is the best deal left should realize that left should not say that modernity only possible modernity is capitalist modernity capitalism is something else modernity is something else they conjoined because of historical whatever period humanity went through this tells us that we should forge the first person we should approach if left were united and left wanted to play a role in defeating fascism first thing it will do is to forge an alliance with ideologically liberal congress and on that basis supporting them strengthening them force other dubious even dubious regional forces to fall behind otherwise if congress does not become a strong no united front is possible you know on the basis of left and on the basis of others no united front is possible against hindutva fascism so that is where i will stop i am sorry if i have taken enough time but you know and i am sorry if it is a very simple conclusion a very very long winded argument but that is what we are you know i mean when we come by gut feeling of or to simple conclusions next time there is no surety that we will come to the right conclusion so we even simple conclusions must have good logic behind it good analysis behind it a method behind it if that method is not there you cannot depend on your common sense always to come to a correct conclusion so if my argument is long winded excuse me for that but that is necessary because that is a lesson that left must learn thank you